Everyone, please have a seat. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant. And we're back on the record. The state may call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Detective uh, Sergeant Bunting. Sir, if you come over here to the witness stand, please have a seat. <laughs> Good morning, Detective uh, Sergeant. That's fine. Good morning. Um, can you briefly introduce yourself to the jury this morning? Good morning. My name is uh, Sergeant Joseph Bunting. Is that microphone on just to? What was the name? Bunting, B-U-N-T-I-N-G. I think if you, you're tall, so if you raise that up a little bit. Is a little red light on? Yes, it is. Okay. And Sergeant, um, briefly describe where you work and what you do. I've been employed with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office for a little over 22 years. I'm currently assigned to the patrol division uh, for the past year. Walk us through your career with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. Okay. I started with the Sheriff's Office in February 6th of 02. Uh, from there, I went to the Basic Police Academy at Carlotta, which is in Coolidge, Arizona. Upon graduation from the Basic Police Academy, I went to the field training program at the Sheriff's Office, which consisted of uh, 12 weeks. Uh, upon going through the FTO program uh, during my tenure, um, I was assigned to the patrol division. Uh, from there, I went into the canine uh, program. I was canine officer for five years. Um, from there, about three years on, I became a field training officer myself, which in turn trains the new officers coming out of the academy. Um, continued through that, um, became a SWAT operator. I've been a SWAT operator for 19 plus years. Uh, gone up the ranks. I am currently the SWAT commander for the department. Um, I became a corporal uh, on patrol f for probably five years into my career. Um, continued on patrol. The majority of my uh, career has been on patrol. Um, from there, I uh, became a phlebotomist. Um, I went on to become a general instructor for the sheriff's office. Um, became a uh, firearms instructor for the department, uh, taught at uh, academy level and um, at the, for the department. I went on to become a rifle instructor uh, for the department. Uh, had, I have other qualifications through my general instructor uh, certification. Uh, from there, continued on through patrol, uh, became a uh, motor unit. Uh, so I was able to ride the motor unit for the department. Um, in 2016, uh, I, I left the patrol division and became a detective. Uh, so I was a detective for just over six years for the department. And then in April of last year, I was promoted to sergeant and then reassigned back to patrol. And that's where I am currently. Thank you, Sergeant. And you briefly touched on firearms and rifle instructor. What is that? What does that include? It's additional training uh, to become a, a firearms instructor. You first start at uh, basically the handgun, shotgun level, and then after that, you become a rifle instructor um, through the through the state. And then that, in turn, I can now teach firearms for the department. And I have taught at uh, the academy level for cadets at the academy on how to shoot a gun, proper you know handling of the weapon, and stuff like that. So that would include, would it include safety? Correct. Operation? Correct. And you said you handled weapons of, from handguns? Handguns, shotguns, and rifles. How about semi-automatic weapons? Yes, we do. That's what we use on patrol. And in your tenure at the Sheriff's Department, honing in, especially on your detective years, um, what kind of cases did you work? Um, unfortunately, uh, 
being a detective, uh, we mostly deal with a lot of sexual assault type uh, crimes at the department. Um, in my tenure, I've had probably a dozen or so homicide investigations at the patrol level, uh, moving up into uh, criminal investigations division, um, homicides, murder suicides, um, uh, suspicious death investigations, uh, fraud cases, uh, and so on. And what I, I don't want to assume, but in those 12 or so homicides and a few of those murder suicides, was, was there a weapon involved? Yes. In all of those? Um, not all of them, uh, but majority of them, yes. And what kind of weapon was generally used? Um, I've had rifles, handguns, um, uh, rifles and handguns. I'm going to direct your attention to this investigation. Were you called to assist in this investigation? I was. I was originally called on January 30th. Uh, I was actually out sick that day, so I didn't actually start uh, helping out with the investigation until the 31st. You came out the next day, January 31st? Correct. And what, were your respons what, were, what responsibilities were you tasked with on the 31st? Um, mostly I, I assisted the other detectives. Um, when I came into work that morning, um, I was directed to gather some information for a secondary search warrant, um, which uh, I assisted with Detective Ainsa, uh, getting all that information. And then once that was obtained, uh, going out to the Kelly Ranch. Okay, so you said second search warrant, so you were aware of a first search warrant already being conducted? Uh, correct. The, the first search warrant was the, the day of the incident on the 30th. All right, and you go back on the 31st the next day? Correct. Do you know what the, what the purpose of the second search warrant was? Uh, it was brought to my attention at that time when officers and deputies were, were on scene. Um, there was two outbuildings, I guess like a, a, some type of barn in a smaller building uh, that we were going to uh, obtain a search warrant for. Uh, and then while at the sheriff's office, uh, I learned that uh, the rifle in question uh, was not found on the previous day. So the, were you aware that uh, an AK-47 was found on the first search warrant? Correct. And that AK-47 was not the same weapon as identified by another officer? That's correct. And so one of the goals of the second search warrant was to search for the AK-47 recognized by the officers? Correct. Walk us through that second search warrant. What, walk, walk the jury through the scene and how that occurred. What would you do? Okay. Um, once the search warrant was obtained, uh, myself and other uh, detectives went back out to the Kelly Ranch. Um, upon our arrival, uh, we met with Mrs. Kelly. Uh, at that time, uh, we learned that she was actually going to be leaving um, to go stay at her friend's house somewhere. Um, I mentioned uh, w when she left, if there's any weapons in, in her vehicle, she did uh, state there was a weapon in her vehicle. Um, I asked, because uh, there was two vehicles on the property, uh, she pointed out that the second vehicle was Mr. Kelly's. I asked if there was a weapon inside Mr. Kelly's uh, vehicle, and she said there was. I brought this information uh, to Detective Ains' attention. Uh, we modified uh, the search warrant uh, through the phone uh, with the judge. Um, upon uh, doing that, uh, we retrieved two more, it was uh, uh, two more handguns, one out of each vehicle uh, from Mr. Kelly and Mrs. Kelly's vehicle. From, from there, once that was uh, done and uh, both vehicles were searched, uh, we went down to those outbuildings. The, it's a large barn, and come to find out, I guess the second smaller, view, uh, smaller house was a pump house for the, for the ranch. Um, those were probably, uh, I'm guessing, maybe a little over 100 yards or more down past uh, the main house. Um, we went down there, searched uh, both places, uh, nothing of evidence was, was found at either location. Uh, once we cleared there, we went uh, back to where the decedent was located. I'm, um, I'm going to pause you right there, so just so we have an understanding. Okay. You're first on scene, you were searching cars, pump house, and a barn. That's correct. And now next you're moving to where you were told the victim was located. That's correct. 
And when you got to where the victim was located, did you notice anything about the terrain, vegetation? I did. What did um, you notice? It was a uh, desert environment. There was uh, sage grass or sage brush, if, if, if you want to call it. Um, and there was a small two-track uh, leading kind of up in the northeast direction. Um, big enough, maybe, maybe a little bit big enough for a car, but maybe like a small tractor or something to, to go up in uh, there. Um, I was then pointed out uh, where the decedent was actually located. Um, there was still uh, dried blood um, on the grass of where he was. We, I was able to see where, where he was found. Um, from there, uh, we began to... I'm going to pause, so I don't want to get you too far into this story. So when you are on scene, you see the vegetation. How high is this vegetation, do you recall? Um, I'd be guessing I'm I'd probably shin height for, for me in different places. You're a tall man. Correct. That'd be like knee height for me. <laughs> so maybe I'd say maybe a foot or so. Let me ask you about... The, the, the vegetation around. Was there any signs, in, from what you recall, any signs of a struggle? I did not uh, observe any type of signs of any type of struggle. Uh, I didn't see any type of uh, uh, footprint or shoe prints in the, in the dirt uh, around. So you're at the scene, and what was your goal when you're at the, the scene where the victim's body was located? What's the, what's the purpose of being there? Uh, other detectives and myself, we began to search uh, in around the, the immediate area. At that time, we did bring out a metal detector. Um, I didn't use a metal detector that, that day. Uh, another detective started searching for any type of uh, physical evidence. We're looking for the bullet, looking for shell casings. Um, was, was any found? Uh, no. And so I, do, I do need to go back a little bit because there's one thing that I did before we went down to search the houses. Sure, let me ask you, did you do anything before you searched the house? Yes, we did. Um, and I apologize. Um, for my knowledge of what happened, because I wasn't there the first day, um, Detective Vainza actually brought me into the back patio of the Kelly residence and showed me the location of where the, the, the canine found the first spent shell casing. Um, we get, when, I'm going to pause. So we, we, we got to get our chronology correct, right, what, what's going on. So you first arrive on scene. The, the first thing that Detective Ianza does with you is what? Um, he took me in the backyard because I wanted to kind of familiarize myself with the scene so I can start painting the picture. Um, and at that point, he actually uh, pointed out where the first shell casing was located. The shell casing located by a canine from ATF. That's correct. Right, and then from there you search cars, barn out, barn well, and pump. Just just before walking or driving down there, um, I I did a visual search of the backyard, uh, looking at the house um, that uh, the Kelly house, especially in the in the back, uh, has an overhang uh, with some peel poles. Peel poles are just basically the wood poles peeled with the or, or have the bark peeled off, um, decorative peel poles. I was looking at the house, looking at the. Uh, the peel poles. There's several mes mesquite trees in the backyard. I, I began looking for any type of bullet strikes, looking for um, impacts in both directions, coming from where the scene was uh, alleged to be at, and to uh, see was from from the back porch, looking out to, into the desert. I was looking to see if I could find any type of uh, evidence, and I could not at that time. Okay, so we just I just want to make sure we get the the sequence of events correct. correct. Your first thing you did was. Ienza showed you, Detective Ienza showed you where the canine found a shell casing. That's correct. And then you did a, a perimeter review of the scene looking for bullet strikes and so forth. That's correct. And the next thing you did, I will make sure this is correct, next thing you did was a search of cars, pump house, and barn. That's correct. And then you went to where the victim's body was located. That is correct. Okay, and now this is where we we'll pick up our story. You have metal detector out there searching for shell casings and a projectile. That's correct. And how many, do you recall how many metal detectors you had? Uh, at that point, we only had one metal detector. Um, another detective um, was utilizing that metal detector. And then uh, I began to, uh, again, search um, 
for any type of evidence from where the decedent was, kind of walking back towards Mr. Kelly's residence. Um, there's a lot of mesquite trees of different sizes. Um, bigger, uh, majority of them are all kind of medium sized to small. Um, as you walk from where the decedent was back to the Kelly residence, um, I did locate a small uh, mesquite tree that would that was broken and a limb uh, was off. Um, at that point, uh, I couldn't determine uh, if it was hit with a bullet or if an animal actually knocked it off because I did locate some animal hair uh, off to the side of where that branch was uh, located. I did bring this up to... Uh, Hold on a second. You're, you're getting... You, you go way too far for me. <laughs> way too far. So you do a search and you see a branch that looked like it was broken, right? That's correct. And at this stage, do you take it or do you take photos? Um, again, I, I told the other de uh, detectives they came over and photographed the branch. Okay. And you leave the branch there? That's correct. All right. I want to stay on this metal detectors. Mm -hmm. So the 31st... The next day after the event, you guys have one metal detector out there. That's correct. Do you guys come back on the 1st, the next day? No, we come back on the 1st, and at that time we have two metal detectors. Well, I, I think I asked maybe a poorly worded question. The next day, the 1st, you guys come back again with a metal detector. That is correct. Two. That is correct. And you search what area? Um, at this point, I have a metal detector. Uh, and we ex kind of expanded that original search from where the decedent was uh, past. So I probably went maybe 100 yards or more past uh, in a direction that I thought maybe the, the projectile would have gone or any type of any shell casings may have, may have been. Um, there's a small uh, wash, uh, maybe 100 yards a little more behind where that decedent was located, there was a, a, a bigger mesquite tree back there. I looked in, in that wash with a metal detector. I was even using my metal detector to uh, actually uh, scan the trees and the tree trunks to see if there's any type of uh, impact into the tree. And at that point, there was, there was no evidence uh, of any shell casings. No, uh, we did not locate any bullet or any evidence uh, in and around and past uh, where the decedent was laying. How far back? As, as you were looking out from the house out, and there's a victim's body, how far, continuing southbound, how far do you go with your med detector and your search? Uh, again, I think I, I went maybe 100 yards past of where the decedent was, behind him, back towards, uh, towards the wash. And when you're back there, you're, you got your metal detector and you're doing your, your thing? That's correct. And then are you also observing the environment? Yes. Do you see... Footprints, anything like that out there? Uh, do you recall? No, uh, I don't see any uh, uh, shoe prints. Uh, I don't see any type of struggle. I don't see any layup spots where the grass would be laid down, say maybe someone was laying down or, or hiding. I did not see any, uh, any of that. Give me one second, Detective. Ms. Hunley, I'm looking for the photo with the canine to remind the jury. As Ms. Hunley is assisting me, Sergeant Bunting, after you, let's go back to the 31st. I jumped in time. I Tarantinoed it to the 1st. Let's go back now to the 31st. Okay. After you did your metal detector on the 31st, what did you do at Someone, you're with them, but what did you do after the metal detector? Uh, once we uh, searched uh, in and around the desert part uh, from uh, where the scene was, um, we then moved to the Kelly residence and began the, the search uh, of the Kelly residence itself, the interior. Interior. I forgot to ask, did you, on the, on the metal detectors, on either the 31st or the 1st, did you also search the area between the victim and the house? I did on, on the first. Okay, I forgot to ask you that. So staying with the metal detectors, you searched from the victim all the way to the house. Uh, that is correct. Including the paddock? Correct. There's, there's two barbed wire fences uh, in between um, where the decedent is in Mr. Kelly's residence. There's a, uh, once you pass uh, that little road I, I explained, you walk a little further, um, and there's a barbed wire fence 
and it, it appears to be like a paddock or some type, it's not corral, but it's a paddock, and then a little bit further, and then there's a barbed wire fence that surrounds Mr. Kelly's residence. Anything found? Uh, no. So you go into assist with the search warrant of the house? That is correct. And walk us through what you did in the search warrant of the house. The interior, we'll go to the exterior in a sec with the interior. Correct. Um, I began uh, searching the, the garage area uh, with other, uh, other detectives. Uh, we moved from the garage uh, into the interior of the residence. Um, while I was uh, searching uh, off the garage, I can't remember what type of room that is, um, I overheard, uh, I think it was uh, Sergeant Flores, he was my sergeant at the, at the time, uh, who located uh, the AK-47 rifle in a different room uh, hanging behind the door. And what was your responsibility? What, what did you do with the AK-47? Um, I went to where the deputies were located. Um, I noticed that uh, the magazine on, was still in the, in the rifle. Um, I donned gloves because I already had gloves on, and I cleared that magazine. The magazine did have uh, live rounds in it, and also there was a, uh, a live uh, 7.62 by 39, which is the, the bullet for an AK-47, up in the chamber of the rifle. So it was, it was ready to go. Would you recognize that rifle again? <clears throat> yes. Detective Enza, can you assist <clears throat> judge with permission? Can we get 101? Oh, you want 101? Yeah. Huh? Oh. In the meantime, D Detective, I'm going to show you. Do you know what exhibit number? I'm going to show you just for us. I think it's already been admitted. It's already been admitted. I'm going to show you on the screen. Exhibit 34, 40, image 41, 93. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> you are. We're publishing, yeah. I'm sorry, with permission for the court, of course. Detective Bunting, I mean, Sergeant Bunting, is that the canine that you rec remember? I wasn't there when the canine... No. But that was the that was the location of what um, Detective Ainta showed me. Yes, and that's placard number one. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Miss Henley. And Detective, you can use the table over here. Is there opening that? Another question for you, Detective. Um, I keep doing that yes, to you. That's sorry. Fine. That's I keep fine. demoting you in some way. I'm that's sorry, fine. Sergeant. That's fine. Sergeant, um, during your review of the property on the, se the second search warrant and the, the next day search warrant, did you find any backpacks of drugs? No. Do you find any, any backpacks whatsoever? No. Do you find any guns laying around? No, besides the two that we removed from the vehicles. I'm talking about out in the field and... No. Okay. Sorry, Detective, can you hold that Exhibit 101, which has already been admitted to evidence, up for Detective or Sergeant Bunting? Sergeant Bunting, do you recognize Exhibit 101? Uh, I do. Is that the weapon you found on the second search warrant or someone else found and you helped clear? It is. Um, at the time when I found it, there was actually a uh, flashlight that was taped to the barrel. Thank you, Detective. On the, he's eventually, some, at some point, DPS shows up. Do you know what day that was, DPS shows up? That was on the first. Okay, on the, let's go to the first now. DPS, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing probably the most important part of your testimony today. Thank you for that, that eyeball look at me. So you also, during the search, you also looked outside the house, right? Uh, correct. After uh, we did a search of the interior, located the weapon, um, I went back to the rear of the residence. Um, I went back to the rear of the residence because behind the residence, and I, I, I apologize, I don't know my desert plants, um, but there's a, there's a plant in the backyard that kind of 
uh, has these, uh, I don't even know what you call it, but it kind of comes up and it, it drapes down onto the desert or onto the ground. Um, I, I was drawn to that thinking that if something may be uh, in that bush or underneath that bush because it was, it was just kind of uh, out of the ordinary for, for me. Um, I looked uh, originally where the, the first shell casing was located. I looked around that bush. I looked in that bush, and then as I walked around, there were some other uh, prickly pear cactus or other desert cactus uh, in that same area. As I walked around in the front of it, if you want to call it, as I, as I approached that bush, uh, I located uh, an additional shell casing, spent shell casing uh, on the ground. Um, Hold on. Be- before you get too far, I'm going to show you some photos, but who's with you when you're out there when you, when you spot some shell casings? At that time, it was just me. Okay, and did you get some assistance from other officers? Detectives? That is correct. Once I found the first shell casing, I, I yelled over for uh, Detective Ainsa to grab his camera. All right, I'm going to show you some photos. Exhibit 34, I'm going to show you image 4433. And just for us, I'm just going through the proper way here. I'm going to show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, actually, I'm just going to approach you and show you directly. Okay. Commissioner, approach you. Yes, moment to review those photos. Mm-hmm. The stickies are mine, Sergeant. That's, that's fine. <clears throat> yes, I, I do recognize these photos. Are they fair and accurate representations of what you found, the shell casings? Yes. Move to admit, Your Honor, Government Exhibit Exhibit 34, images 4433 to 4458. Let me just see them first. Oh, sure. Exhibit 34, pages 4443 through 4458 are admitted. I think it's 4433. 4433? Yes, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Exhibit 34, pages 4433 through 4458 are admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Grant. I'm going to have Ms. Hunley drive for me. I'm going to show you what's been State Exhibit 34, and we'll start referring to them as just by their image number, 4433. What's that picture of, Sergeant? Uh, that picture shows uh, that bush that I was talking about that I, I don't know the name. It, it kind of drapes down onto the, 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 the ground there. Uh, this is located uh, right outside the, the back patio of Mr. Kelly's residence. Miss Henley, if you can't do the matrix removal, is that, is that you? It's the matrix. The down, the, whatever's happening down here. Don't worry about it if you can't do it. All right. All right. Don't worry about it, Miss Henley. I'm going to show you the next image, 4444. I mean, 4434, I did the same thing, 4434. Sergeant, tell the jury what we're looking at. Uh, what you're looking at there is a, uh, a spent uh, AK-47 round or 7.62 by 3.9 round. At least cut that. Let me just go old school. I'm not sure what's happening. That's fine. I'm not touching anything. I'll do, I'll do the MO. I'll, I'll do the MO. Now. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 4434. 
Sergeant, what are we looking at? Again, you're looking at a uh, spent uh, shell casing. And that's located what part of the house? Uh, in that same area, around that bush, um, right off of the patio. And when you look at that shell casing in 4434, is that an old one, new one? Uh, there's no weathering on it, it sort of appears new. And it's on top of the rocks. I'm going to show you government exhibit image, image 4435. Same type of photo? Same type of photo, uh, same type of shell casing. Show you government exhibit image four four three six. Again, uh, same type of photo in uh, empty spent shell casing. And we'll have a. We're gonna go through every single one, but I'm gonna show you government exhibit image four four three seven. And this is a overview. I can zoom in, but. There is one. There's, there's one right there. You see that one? That's correct. There's one down at the bottom of the page. Oh, I can't see that much. Yeah, you, you zoomed in. I'm zooming out. Right there? Yes, it's, it's blocked by that, what's there on the bottom is. screen, but yes, there's one. Okay. That's government image 4437. Let me show you one with some placards on it, 4438. That's correct. It indicates uh, eight spent, spent shell casings that were located. And you, that's a standard practice to put placards next to the shell casings? Uh, that is correct, and we placed an arrow indicating uh, a, a possible north direction. We should image 4439. Different view? Different view uh, of, this, of the previous uh, picture, yes. Do you recognize this view? Of where, I do. Where's the patio in this view? Uh, the patio, you can actually see it. It's right behind the prickly pear uh, cactus. That, wouldn't that be the front of the house? Is... That could be. on if, if you look, you see the sidewalk kind of do a, uh, uh, a right L. Um, I would say the the front door to that resident is just off of that picture um, at the top, uh, which you don't see uh, just to the right. If you would continue down, um, there's another door that leads into the, uh, the back of the residence there. I will show you a better photo. I'm going to show you image 4440. Recognize that view? I do. And the, the image we're talking about, the, the back patio, do you see the patio? On this I do. View? You can see the, uh, the legs of the other detectives uh, standing on that back patio. And then right behind them, there's a, a door that leads into the residence. Just so we know, the first, that 4439 was a view going this way. And now this is a view of a different angle of that path with the showcase in there, right? That is correct. All right. I'll show you a close-up of one of the shell casings, 4442. Is 
that a close up of a placard one? That is. Do you remember who's, is it Detective Ienza who's taking the photographs? I do believe it was uh, Sergeant Flores who took the, uh, the actual photographs. And this is the same kind of picture, but there's a glove and someone's manipulating the, we're doing something with the round. Who's that glove belong to? That's actually my hand. It's my glove. Um, I used a uh, small twig that I located there on the ground. You can see some by my, by my knuckles uh, to put inside the, the spent shell casing. Uh, so the picture indicates me uh, starting to pick up that shell casing. And then with the assistance of uh, Detective Ainsa, uh, we then placed that one shell casing into a, uh, uh, an evidence bag. <clears throat> Did you do that same same procedure with the with the remaining uh, uh, all eight spent shell casings? Yes. Let me show you image four four five two. You were talking to the jury about some plant that was like overhanging the, the gravel? That is correct. Is that the, like the... And that indicates that the plant in question that I was talking about, how it kind of drapes down onto the, the rocks. And uh, that, that right there shows kind of the reason why I was looking in and around that, um, that plant uh, and located one of the uh, spent shell casings. And some of that would be difficult to see, right? And that is correct. I'm going to show you image 4454. That's a closer look up of a shell casing number seven. That is correct. Kind of tucked under this plant. That right? is correct. You got, was it, how many were there? There was a total of uh, eight spent shell casings. And what did you do with the eight shell casings? Uh, they were all um, submitted into evidence. Those are normal size hand gloves. Sorry about that. I'm going to have you open exhibit. I think one exhibit is 103 to 106. The envelope which should show 103 to 106. I'm going to have you reopen both of those. And council can go up there and take a look. I think they've been up there before. You can open both of them. One should be 103 to 106, and then one should be 107 to 110. That's it. All right.
verses 22JA through 25JA. Can you take each one of those out and to yourself, open them up and take a look? Inside the, the big one, they're all individually. Uh, uh, sure, packed. but just to yourself, I want you to review them on your own. Okay. You done review? Oh, just, we're just going to do one at a time. I don't want to cross contaminate or cross pollinate here. So, 103 to 106, you re done reviewing those shell casings? Yes. Are those the same shell casings you found on scene? Uh, yes, they are. Can you move to admit, just so we can formally do this, Government Exhibit 103 to 106? No objection. 103 through 106 are admitted. Sergeant, can you just take one of those out just to remind the jury what that looks like? Yes. Just uh, This is a 103. It's a uh, spent shell casing. And what's the, can you tell what brand or what type of weapon that goes to? Um, I recognize it as a uh, uh, AK-47 round or a 7.62 by 3.9 round. It's kind of hard to see with the, the light that we have, but I recognize the, the round. All right. You can put that back in the, that individual envelope and put all three of the, all four of those back into the bigger envelope. And I want you to mirror the same process on Government Exhibit 107 to 110. Previously opened, and two of the uh, spent shell casings are, are out of the packages. But yes, they're the same uh, uh, 7.62 by 3.9 spent shell casings that were that were located. You are moved to admit Government Exhibit 107 to 110. No objection. 107 through 110 are admitted. Uh, you can put those back in the envelope and put those back in the big envelope. After collecting the eight, spill sh eight spent shell casings, did you do anything else at the house? Um, no, not that, not that evening. Once we collected those, uh, we actually departed the, the Kelly Ranch. You also did, um, you were there for, DPS showed up to do a, a drone? Uh, that is correct, on, uh, on the 1st. So the next day now? The next day, which was Wednesday, uh, February 1st. To remind the jury, that's the day when you go back out with the metal detectors, right? Uh, that is correct. We went out. Uh, we were there uh, probably a little, little over an hour uh, periods before DPS arrived. And you were there when DPS? Did you help DPS out? I did. It was uh, Trooper Reyna that uh, arrived on scene. He's a drone operator. Um, upon his arrival, I walked him through the scene um, to show him kind of the layout and what we wanted to be photographed. And you got... Firearm expertise, right? That's correct. And you know about ejection patterns. I'm not going to quiz you on this, but you know about ejection patterns? No, correct. We In the drone footage, there are cones. Do you know who put the cones out? I did. You put the cones out on the patio? That is correct. Based on what? Um, my theory of uh, ejection patterns being that that rifle... Uh, is a right-handed ejection, meaning when the, the bullet is fired, the extractor grabs that uh, spent shell casing and it ejects it off to the right-hand side of that weapon system. And so you did your best guess about where the, shoot, where the person who shot, where the spell, 
spent shell casings landed where the shooter would have been. Uh, that is correct. Is that precise science? Uh, no. But they're not. Do you remember a gazebo? Yes. The, the, the ejection pattern doesn't resemble someone shooting from the gazebo, does it? No. Uh, my knowledge of that weapon system, even though I've not shot it a lot, um, again, it, it, it extracts and pulls it out to the right-hand side and slightly forward. So it was my best guess of if I would be standing right here uh, where those shell casings were. That was just a uh, approximate guess that I did. You also looked at, in, in this case, you were tasked with looking at Border Patrol video. Uh, that is correct. And do you know how many discs of video that you looked at? Uh, it was a total of uh, five uh, surveillance discs uh, on two different occasions. And did other officers, detectives, were they also tasked with their own set of discs? Uh, that is correct. So there's a lot of drone, not a drone, but a lot of Border Patrol surveillance videos, right? Uh, correct. I don't know what the uh, total number, but yes. Live hours? Um, yes. And do you remember the drone foot? I, mean, I keep saying drones, strike that. The Border Patrol surveillance video. You reviewed it before court today, right? That is correct. And the view, do you remember what the view was? What property? Yes, it was. Well, the, it was the, the desert view from wherever those cameras were located. Sure, but do you see any, any property distinction, any property belonging to George Kelly? Yes, we do. Uh, there's two footers that we saw, um, one of uh, what's called an infrared. It's a black and white image um, where you see a male subject and two animals uh, walking towards that pump house. I'm familiar with that pump house. Uh, the second video was in color, uh, indicating that, that same image. And you see... Do you see other people arriving on scene on the video? That is correct. Uh, later, uh, you do see uh, other de uh, deputies arriving in their marked units. And so the videos you reviewed showed Border Patrol <coughs> and SO arriving and also of George Kelly and his dogs. That is correct. There's a part of the video where you see someone else running, right? Not running. He's walking. Walking. Um, where are you walking towards? Uh, they're walking on a hillside. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you where that image was actually located because it's it's kind of zoomed into that male subject in the desert around. So there's no nothing in the distance to indicate where that person was. And it's, there's border patrol and SO on scene, right? That is correct. All right. And then, did you ever see anyone running towards the border wall? No, I did not see anybody running. And then we're going to talk about this tree thing real quick. Um, I'm going to show exhibit 137 and 137.1. One. Sergeant, I think you could do two things at once. I'm going to ask you to open Exhibit 137 mm -hmm. and 137.1. I think they're both inside that box. Okay. Um, as you're doing that, I'm going to ask you, at some point, someone's tasked you with the job of collecting the tree branch, a tree branch, right? That is correct. Do you remember what time of year that was? Uh, that was in August. August. Do you know who tasked you with that, that job? Uh, we received information from the county attorney's office. Uh, to go back uh, and retrieve that branch that I originally found uh, on the, the 31st. And that information came down from, I guess, one of the experts. I do not know his name, but one of the experts requested us to go back out and, and uh, collect that tree. So you go back out. Do you remember who wi who's with you when you go back out? Uh, it was myself, uh, Detective Barba, and at the time, Sergeant Flores. And I can't remember if there was a deputy out there or not. Okay, go ahead and open that box. I, I, I want you to keep those things in the bag. There should be a clear bag in there, Sergeant.
don't don't pull it up. I just want you to see if you no no don't pull it down. <laughs> do you recognize those two items? I do. Are those what? Where are those? Uh, they are cut pieces of the tree in question. Your Honor, move to admit Government Exhibit One Three Seven and One Three Seven Point One into evidence. No objection. One three seven and one three seven point one are admitted. And Detective can move to have him do the runway showing with the jury. Assume by that you mean published to the jury. I'm sorry, you published to the jury. Yes, you may. Both, so you both walk down and time. yeah, both of them. Take both of them and just slowly walk so the jury can see the the items. Thank you, Sergeant. You can put those in the box too, Sergeant. Okay. I think earlier you testified that you you saw some possible animal hair on those on that branch, right? It wasn't on the branch, it was actually off to the side on the ground. And there was a horse and a couple of cows at the time in the area of, of, around where that, that branch was located. You know what kind of, do you remember the horse? What I remember like? the horse. What it looked like? It was, an, it was an older horse. It was brownish, darker, not dark, dark brown, but a kind of like a reddish brown in color horse, older. And that's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross examination. Hold on. I looked at you for a second. I'm sorry, Your Honor, just a couple follow-up before I conclude. And I may have missed it, but did we have foundation as to when these branches were removed? If I missed it, I thought it. I'm sorry. August 2nd of 23. It was under search warrant uh, 23052. Thank you. So while they're looking for that, you might have noticed, members of the jury, that it's only one lawyer from each side can examine a witness. Um, and so they look to co-counsel before they finish on either side to see if the other counsel has any questions. It's just one lawyer, one witness. We don't allow them to tag team. So that's why they're doing it the way they do it. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 121, just for, just so we could do this. Things have already been admitted. I'm going to publish. 
you recognize that photo? I do. It's from the drone footage. And just to remind everyone, there's cones situated kind of dead center. That is correct. And those are the cones you're referring to? That is correct. And the casings, just so we understand, the casings are the where? Ca the casing 22JA through 29 uh, circled in yellow are the ones that I located. Uh, the blue uh, 1JA uh, was the one shell casing uh, that was recovered the, the previous night. And 22 excuse, excuse me a second. I'm sorry. The clerk informs me that this exhibit has not been admitted. It was part of the... I'm sorry. Let's do this the right way. Do you recognize that photograph? I do. Move, move to admit, Your Honor. Government Exhibit 121. No objection. 121 is admitted. So, thank you, Your Honor. I assume too much. Sorry about that, Sergeant. So the, the blue circle is the first shell casing 1JA? That is correct. And then in the yellow circle is the other ones, 22 through 29 JA? That is correct. And those correspond with exhibits 103 to 110. That, is, that is correct. Those ones you just looked at, right? Yes. And those are the ones you put place cards on? Yes, the one circled in yellow. And did you also, who's responsible for putting cones around where the victim's body was located? Do you recall? I don't recall. I, I, I think I was with uh, Trooper Raina at the time. I don't remember if I did it or if Trooper Raina did, but I was, I was present when those cones were, were placed. One of you two did it? That is correct. And did someone tell you where the body was at? No, it, due to the stain on the ground, I was still able to locate where the seat was laying. Okay, based upon the physical evidence on scene, you put the cones around that, and that's where the body was. That is correct. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Very well. Cross-examination. Thank you. I just want to talk a little bit about the metal detecting that you did. You said that you went, would it be south of the body or east of the body towards the wash? That is correct. I would say east. Okay, it, towards the ravine that's on the far side of where the body was located, correct? That is correct. So that's moving away from the house, right? Yes. And then you also moved towards the house through those barbed wire fences looking for a bullet, correct? That is correct. And even up on the trees, all in that <clears throat> pathway, correct? Uh, that is correct, on both sides. On both the smaller sides. smaller trees were harder, but the bigger trees, yes. So that's generally an area that goes east to west, right? That's the, the path that you covered, essentially? Yes. Did you cover any other paths like north, south, or search in any other directions besides those two? Yes, I did. Um, behind where the decedent was, back to uh, that ravine, um, I did go uh, slightly north uh, to, to cover uh, a wider swath. And again, we probably went maybe 100 yards, a little more. Uh, behind to where that ravine is, and then uh, slightly north, and then uh, south, if you want to say south. Yeah, you say slightly north and slightly south. Is that slightly north and south in that general east-west path that you're covering? That is correct. Did you ever go directly north from where the body was located, for example, or directly south? We did. We uh, actually went uh, all the way to the end of where uh, the first barbed wire fence is, um, surrounding Mr. Kelly's ranch and again we covered that whole area uh, between uh, the paddock uh, and then back to where the scene was laying. So was there, is it fair to say then that you did sort of a radius around where the body was located? Did you search that entire radius or did you limit yourself? Uh, no, we I would say it's in the immediate area around um, 100 yards, again, a little more behind, uh, further north. In we every tried. direction then, more or We less? tried, yes. Okay. And you didn't find any evidence of any bullets in that search, right? We did not find any evidence of any bullets or any spent shell casings uh, besides the eight that I located. Okay. And you stood on the patio, obviously, of Mr. Kelly's property, right? Yes. And you were able to look through that 
mesquite thicket, essentially, correct? That Towards where the body was located, right? Yes. And you also stood out where the body is located, correct? Yes. And you looked back towards the house also, correct? Yes. Could you just describe that line of sight for the jury? Um, again, uh, standing from uh, the back patio of Mr. Kelly's residence, um, looking out to where the decedent is, um, there is a covered gazebo um, right off the patio behind his house. From there, there's some, um, some bigger, like thicker mesquite trees. Um, past the first barbed wire fence in that paddock, uh, there's some smaller uh, mesquite trees. Um, some thicker areas than others or some spaces in between. Uh, again, this is desert, so at that time in January, everything's dead. There's no leaves on the, on the trees. Uh, the grass is brown. Um, there is a kind of like opening um, prior to where the decedent is, and uh, the final resting of the decedent is, is located right, right near a tree. So just to sum that up, there's a lot of stuff in between the patio and where the body is located, right? That is correct. There's trees, right? I just said that, yes. And there's different obstacles like a smoker, for example, right? Did you see a smoker smoke. out on the back? Um, behind the gazebo, uh, there is a, I think, I, I don't know if you want to call it a smoker or a fire pit or something, I guess. And the gazebo's out there as well, right? Yes. And um, there are wood piles also, right? Did you notice those? Those are small. But there are wood piles out there in between? Correct. Okay. And you searched through that whole area with metal detectors, and you didn't find any evidence of any bullets passing through that thicket, correct? Besides that broken tree, and again, I can't confirm if that was actually broken by a bullet or by the animal. Um, that's the only thing I located. And I looked uh, on both sides of the trees with the metal detector on the bigger trees, giving any benefit of doubt of, of bullets coming towards Mr. Kelly. Okay, so you found no evidence then of bullets no. going through there. Okay. I just want to talk about the shell casings that you located near the patio. You located those on the second, the second day, or this was the, during the second search of the property, correct? Correct, on the 31st. So other investigators had been out there on the 30th, and they'd searched the property, right? I don't want to assume whatever, I wasn't there. Okay, but those shell casings were not located until you located them on the 31st, right? That is correct. Okay, and those were just out in plain view, right? Yes. I'm you didn't need a metal detector to find them, no, right? No, I, I did not. I found them in plain view. So you just looked on the ground, and there they were, right? Yes. Those were next to a prickly pear cactus, correct? They were in front, yes. Okay. You talked about shell casing, ejection, and things like that. You put the cones where was your best guess that somebody might be standing, right? That is correct. But that's just a guess, right? With my knowledge, yes. It was, it was left of where those shell casings were located with a little bit of distance from where uh, those cones were to where they were actually located on the ground. And you obviously agree that while shell casings are ejected, they can bounce off of things if there are things around. That is correct. Like that prickly pear cactus, for example, right? Yes, that and rocks. Right. Did you describe, do any measurements or positioning to precisely locate all of those shell casings? I did not. Do you know if anybody did that? I, again, I don't want to presume, but I, I did not do that. And in order to basically memorialize what you found, you, you guys took pictures of the shell casings, right? That is correct. You put those placards down by each one that you found, right? Correct. And then that was just photographed from a number of different angles, right? That is correct. And then after you took those photographs, you picked up the shell casings, correct? Yes, once they were photographed, and then again photographed as we were picking them up, we picked them up and put okay. them in bags. So you didn't measure the distance between each shell casing or anything like that, right? No, I did not. Didn't get any precise coordinates or anything to show exactly where they were, right? I didn't. I do not know if anybody else did any type of GPS. Okay. Did it, was anyone there who had GPS while you located and picked up these shell casings? Again, I don't want to presume what someone else had or didn't have. I did not have, and I did not do that. 
Okay. And you saw the shell casings, discovered them, and then you were there the entire time they were being photographed and then picked up, right? That is correct. So you observed the discovery and the documentation and the collection of the shell casings, right? That is correct. And you didn't observe any taking of precise measurements? No. Okay. I want to go back a little bit to the distance between those shell casings and where the body was eventually located. You would agree it's difficult to see a person if you're standing on the patio and that person is standing out where the body was located, right? Difficult to see, no. Not, it's not difficult to see, you don't think? Well, you got to remember in January there was no leaves on the tree. There was the grass that was only maybe a foot high, so you could see uh, through, that, through those trees. Did you have Detective Barba go stand out there at some point? At some point, yes. I think we did take a photograph. I did not take it, but a photograph was taken. And you were standing back by the patio and looking through to see Detective Barba, right? That is correct. He was wearing black, right? Uh, black and tan, yes, ma'am. And he's just standing out there, just standing there, correct? Correct. If I do remember right, he was standing where the decedent was uh, discovered. So he wasn't trying to hide, right? No. And he obviously wasn't wearing camouflage or anything, right? That is correct. And you say that you can see this from the patio. What about from inside the house? I did not look from inside the house. I, I was on the outside uh, looking at where uh, Detective Barber was, if that's what you're referring to. Were you in the house at any point? I was. And so you know what the kitchen and living room area of that house looks like, right? Uh, vaguely. And you'd have to look out through some windows to see out into this area, correct? Yes, there are a couple windows on the back patio uh, by, the, by that back door. Did you ever attempt to look out through those windows to see if you could observe something at that distance from the house? I did not. Do you know if anybody did that? I do not know. KK. I'm going to show you what's been marked as KK. It's already been admitted. Do you recognize this photograph? I do. I think that's the smoker you were referring to. Yes. Is this the photograph that you're saying um, somebody took of Detective Barba? Yes, you can see Detective Barba standing uh, between the trees in the back uh, wearing the black shirt. And this photograph is pretty zoomed in, is that right? Fair to say? Again, I, I don't want to presume. I did not take that picture to say if it was zoomed or not. Can you just um, point to where you see Detective Barba here? Point on my bullet show? Can you? Well, here, let me help you. Yeah, you could. If it, if it hit, well, it was, Something like that. No, you, there's a stylus. So. Oh. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, I, I that spot put a, right I there. Put a yellow is... line by mistake, but yes, it's pointing to where the detective barber is. Okay, that's where he's standing. Correct. Showing you basically the same photograph, just from the regular, not zoomed in angle. Do you recognize that photograph? I do. And can you show us where Detective Barba is here? I'll circle it. Well, I just covered him, but it's, it's, it's back there. Can you, um, if you touch the upper left hand of the screen, I think it lets you draw on it or point. Larry, why don't you clear it first? There you go. Thank you. I, cir I circled Did where, you? yeah. Oh, there it is. It's up there, not here. Okay. Thank you. And you're saying that that is easy to see. Well, you also have to remember the human eye can see a lot better than what that picture did, and that's a grainy picture. So when you're standing out there, you can actually see where he was standing. So that doesn't depict a, a true, it depicts a, a picture of what we we're looking at, but in real life, you can actually see that person standing there. 
So if the jury were to go out there and stand where the decedent was located and look back towards the house, it would be a clear view? Well, again, it's times have changed, but I would assume yes. And same thing from standing on the patio looking out there, that's going to be a clear view? Again, it's a different time of year, but you can see. But again, that's where the decedent was actually located. That doesn't mean that's where he was originally seen. And it's going off of that, so give me one sec. You also reviewed some Border Patrol surveillance footage, is that right? Yes. And I think in that footage you were able to locate Mr. Kelly, is that right? That is correct. And Mr. Kelly was walking, correct? Yes, with his two dogs. And you saw him near the pump house, is that right? That's correct. So he's near a road and he's just walking, correct? That is correct. He wasn't chasing anybody, right? I saw him walking. I do not know what he was out there. And he certainly wasn't running, right? No. He, he was, appeared to be just walking around the pump house, um, looking around. When you're reviewing this footage, how do you orient yourself to figure out where what you're looking at is? I mean, orient by looking through that video and saying, I know where that is. Is that what you're asking? Right. How do you know where what you're looking at is? It was hard, um, especially some of that footage was zoomed in um, or a close-up with not a lot of background. Once you can kind of give a bigger picture of behind, you could kind of orientate yourself. Uh, a lot of those images I did not know. Um, I'm familiar with the pump house, so I was able to or orientate myself uh, at that location, being on the Kelly Ranch, and then uh, I'm familiar with both Mr. Kelly's uh, dogs. I, was, I saw him out there the, the, when I was out there, and then Mr. Kelly by the pump house. Was a lot of this footage review, did it involve basically seeing, I don't know, like a cow or some animal out there and not knowing where that location is? Uh, correct. So there was a lot of this footage that you just really couldn't recognize. Is that fair to say? Well... You might want to clear that up, recognize of location. I mean, I could see what they were looking at, but. Right. You mentioned you saw, I think it was a person walking. Did you see that in the footage? That is correct. And you don't know who that person is, right? I do not know. He was walking, stopped, continued walking, uh, looking around. It was, he wasn't running, didn't look like to be hiding. Did you know where he was? No. So you just saw a video of some person somewhere, right? That is correct, and that's what I put in my report. And what was he wearing? Were you able to see that, or is the video not that resolved? It's, it is pixelated. Um, it, it did appear not to be wearing some type of camouflage because it kind of stood out. Um, but to, to say he was wearing blue jeans, I, 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 no. You could, you could see something blue, I do believe, if I remember right. Um, but to, to say it was here in the desert in exactly pinpoint, I could not do that. Could you tell if he was carrying anything? Uh, I don't, I don't recall that. Okay. Um, I think you also mentioned you saw a group of three people at some point. Is that what you saw? Three people. On the surveillance video, did you ever see a group of individuals? Like, there was other deputies. I saw the other deputies. I'm not sure what you're pertaining Somebody to. Somebody who's not law enforcement. Did you ever see a group of individuals? I don't recall that. Okay. So that Border Patrol footage, it also doesn't show, obviously, a body. That's correct, right? No. And it doesn't show somebody who's running to the end of the wall, correct? No, I did not see any of it. You didn't see anybody signaling at a, a vehicle at the end of the wall either, did you? No, I did see uh, vehicles on the, but I did not see anybody trying to signal or. You know. Did you see any vehicle that was at the end of the wall? No, I did see vehicles, but I, I you can't didn't say know where by they were. the end of the wall was. Okay, and you couldn't tell where they were based on what you were looking at? No, there was, you could see a road, there was a, uh, at one point there was a, a grader, um, and I did see some Border Patrol, uh, there was a, a Border Patrol vehicle and another Border Patrol vehicle that was a, a, a recognized as a camera truck, but location I do not know. 
You went, you know what the end of the wall looks like, right? That is correct. You've been there, you've seen it, right? Yes. So if you were to see that on this surveillance footage, you would recognize it, right? That is correct. And you didn't see any of that, right? On the ones, the ones I saw, no. Did you ever find out those Border Patrol vehicles that you mentioned? Did you ever find out who they were or where they were? No. And why is that? Is that just because you can't tell from the surveillance footage? I could not tell. from. I, I was just tasked to view and document anything uh, I saw, um, and that's what I did. And you didn't contact Border Patrol to ask them who these folks were or where they were or anything, did you? Myself, no. Do you know if anybody did that? I do not know. The tree branch that you mentioned, you collected that tree branch because somebody else asked you to do that, right? That is correct. And that was in August, so that's significantly after this event took place, right? Correct. And that was at the behest of the ballistics expert, is that right? I know it was an expert. I, I don't recall the name. Okay. But you hadn't thought to collect it earlier because why? At that time, I, again, I couldn't tell. Um, it was a branch that was broken. Uh, again, there was some uh, animal hair off to the side, uh, not in close proximity. Uh, but again, I, I could not tell at that point uh, if it was a bullet strike or an animal had broke off. Um, it did caught my attention because it appeared to be a fresh break, uh, which we did photograph uh, as we found it. And then at one point, I picked up the broken branch to see if it would fit on top, uh, in which it did. It matched. And then uh, uh, we moved on from there. And Valeria, can I get the whiteboard out when you get a chance? You were on Mr. Kelly's property for quite some time, right? Yes. And you're familiar with the area, right? Yes. And the property he has, it's a house, right, obviously? Yes. There aren't any pine trees on his property, right? I don't recall seeing any, no. Okay. And there's no road that goes from Mr. Kelly's property to the end of the wall. Is that right? Not that I know of, no. And this property is, you can see the border wall from this property, correct? Correct. But it's pretty far away. It's about a mile and a half away from Mr. Kelly's property. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right as the crow flies. I mean, the, the, the train is up and down, but yes. As the crow flies. So if you were to go directly from Mr. Kelly's property to the end of the wall, that would be running a mile and a half over pretty rough terrain, right? Yes. And you certainly wouldn't be using a road, right? Uh, no. There are roads out there, but no. But not on Mr. Kelly's property, right? Just the one that he made going down to his barn and that one behind right. his house. Right. Not one that goes to the end of the wall, correct? correct? And when you're... I know you've been promoted, <laughs> but you are a detective, right? That's correct. And you, you've studied cases and you've worked homicides before, correct? Correct. And yeah. you know it's important, obviously, to evaluate witness statements when they come forward, right? That is correct. And you tend to see, does this statement make sense? Is it consistent with other evidence that I'm observing, right? Correct. Okay. And I just want to draw a picture to hopefully illustrate this. Why don't we do this? Why don't we take our mid-morning break? You can draw your picture on the break. It's uh, 5 to 10. We'll take a 30-minute break. We'll be back in court. Please be in the jury room at 1025. We'll be in recess until 1025. Revise the floor.
Y'all may be seated. The records show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendant. Ms. Larkin, you can oh, get the witness back up here. Thank you. Does this work? Okay. I'm told I need to be louder. Can you hear me okay if I use this? Okay. <clears throat> So I just want to try to illustrate something to help us understand a little bit about the difference between what somebody who testified earlier said and the facts on the ground. So I'm just going to have you illustrate for us what the facts are on the ground when you went to this property to visit this location. So this is very crude, okay, but north, south, west, east, this is Mr. Kelly's house, okay? The body's located to the east of the house, right? It's behind the house. And that's in the east direction, right? You say that, yeah. So body is somewhere over here. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. That's a person. And what's the distance between the house and the body? Uh, 116 yards, 364 feet. 116 yards. And this line down here, I just drew that to symbolize the border wall, okay? The distance from the body to the border wall is about one and a half miles as the crow flies, right? Incorrect. Correct, okay. So 1.5 miles. So I want to illustrate what this witness said about this house and where the witness was oriented. So if the witness says he's facing south and the house is on his left, where does that put the witness? Well, again, yes, it's, it's crude and it's, it's, and it's, it's not uh, a correct depiction of what's going to be out there. Well, where there. does it put him? Well, um, I don't know which... If he says, I'm facing south and the house is to my left, where is he? Where do I draw him? I draw him over here, right? So if he's facing south and the house is on his left, then he's on the west side of the house, right? I don't know if I can answer that because, again, it's, it's, not, it's, it's hard to put him over there and once you guys actually see the house or, or see an actual footage of how the house sits, where the decedent is to the wall. It, it doesn't line up with what you're drawing. So let's just hypothetically say the witness says, I'm facing south and the house is to my left. That puts the witness to the west of the house, right? Well, if, if that's if, what he said. If you're guessing, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to presume, again, what somebody else said. If that's, if that's what you're telling me, okay. All right. If that's what he said, that's obviously not consistent with what you observed when you were out there, Right. Again, that's a total different view of, of what I'm thinking. Where would you put this witness if he says, I'm facing south and the house is to my left? Would you put him up here? Well, no. If, you wouldn't if, put if, him down here. No, if you want to, if you want to orientate a little, a little better of what, what's out there, you have to kind of angle the house towards the top right corner and put north that way instead of just straight up and straight down in east and west. It'd so be the little, house be, is... At a different angle? Yeah, it, it's... At, Does it at, matter which angle the house is at? Well, if you want to be more precise, yes. In terms of saying, I'm facing south and the house is on my left, does it matter what shape the house is? Well, it's, it's going to depict a picture different, yes. So we, get, we just rotate the house and that changes things? From where the decedent is, I don't, I don't see how he, he can be on, the, on that side of the house. Okay, that's all I'm asking is, and this is hypothetical, you didn't talk to this witness, you didn't hear this witness, but if he puts himself facing south with the house on his left, then he's over here, generally, right? If that's what he said. And if he says he was 10 yards away from the house, more or less, when the shooting starts, 
that's also not consistent with what you observed, right? Correct. And if he says the border wall is right here, it's two football fields away. That's what he says, two football fields away. That's also not consistent with what you observed, right? Correct. And he, if he says, house is on my left, I'm facing south, the shots are coming from the right. So he's describing shots coming from his right should be over here. That's not consistent with what you observed either, is it? Not from where the decedent is, no. In fact, that's, this is the story, right? And these are the facts. Well, you're telling me the story again. I don't know. I know you didn't hear the story. If this is the story, they're pretty far off from the actual facts that you observed, right? It doesn't line up from what I see. Can you still hear me? Yes. I'm trying to project a little bit better over here. Okay. So we talked a little bit about what the witness described there also. Um, this same witness described the victim as falling over backwards. Did you make any observations of the body in this case? No. Did you see any photographs of the body in this case? Uh, not too. Yes, but not, I don't no, I'll say no. I don't remember what the, how the decedent was laying. Okay. If he was laying on his stomach, then that's obviously inconsistent with what the witness says as well, right? If that's what you're telling me. And that witness also described the shooter standing directly over Gabriel's body immediately following the shooting. And I know you didn't hear from that witness at all, but if that was a statement that was made, that's also not consistent with your observations of Mr. Kelly being oh, out by the pump house with his dogs, correct? Again, I don't want to presume something that I have no knowledge of. I mean, if you're telling me that, okay. And I'm not asking you to presume or say that that's what the witness said. But if the witness did say, right after this shooting, Mr. Kelly was standing right over Gabriel's body, that's not consistent with what you observed on Border Patrol surveillance, correct? On the surveillance, what I saw was him by the pump house. Right. Do you investigate false reporting ever? We look into it, no, yes. Because that's a crime, right? That is correct. And sometimes people commit that crime, right? People lie to the police. And so what are kind of some of the red flags that you look for? What, what helps you determine whether something is a false report or not? I'm not sure if this goes with what I did that day. I think you're kind of going out, outside that. But um, yes, we have looked into uh, false reporting. Actually, we had one yesterday. What sorts of things do you look into when there's a possibility, or what tells you that there's a possibility that something might be a false report in general? Well, we have to look at the totality of all the circumstances and then see if that information coincides with what uh, either the victim or suspect is telling, talking to us. So if you have a number of different statements, for example, you want to evaluate those statements by testing them or looking at them in conjunction with the totality of everything else that's in the case, right? During our investigation, yeah, we have to look at everything, yes. So you're going to take one statement and you're going to compare it to other statements, right? Correct. And you're going to see if they are close together or if there are some discrepancies, right? Uh, correct. And you're going to take another, that same statement and you're going to put it next to the physical evidence in the case, right? Correct. So if a statement you know, goes against or contradicts the physical evidence in the case, then that statement's obviously less reliable, right? Well, again, we have to look at all the evidence and take it into totality. And you're also comparing those statements to forensic evidence, correct? Through, throughout the investigation, yes. And with a scenario like this, and I know you didn't talk to this witness, I'm not saying that this is what this witness said, Hypothetically, if this witness said what we just illustrated up there, that's a pretty big red flag, right? 
I don't feel comfortable guessing on, on what you're asking me because I had nothing to do with that. I know you didn't have anything to do with it, but hypothetically, if a witness came forward and made a statement that was this inconsistent with the physical evidence that you observed, would you have some concerns about that witness? If I was investigating a crime, I'm not going to say this one here. Yes, we were going to look at all the evidence and take it uh, at face value and look into it to see if it's correct. And I know that you were not the lead detective in this case, right? That is correct. You never talked to this witness or heard anything about what he said, right? That is correct. The lead detective is the person who is tasked with this responsibility, correct? Yes. So whoever the detective is, when they receive a statement like this one, they should look into that, right? In my, in my experience in investigating crimes, uh, especially in the detective, because there's more than one detective, uh, we do talk amongst each other, um, but that's a, a, probably a normal practice during uh, an investigation, any investigation, even at the patrol level. You look at the, uh, all the evidence, all the statements, and then take up... Uh, if it's a true statement or not, yes. And so that should have been evaluated, correct? Well, again, I don't want to speculate what should have done or could have done. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Redirect examination. I'm going to continue on with this hypothetical with what another witness supposedly said. Okay, Detective? Yes. All right. And you weren't there for this testimony, were you? you no. You have, you have not been in court? No. No one's talked to you about other people's testimony in court, have they? No. And right. during this investigation, I was promoted in April, so I had left uh, the detective division uh, while this investigation was still going on. We'll walk through. We'll walk through this. Is that on? That's on. Is that on? Yes. Okay. Good. We'll walk through this hypothetical. And on this hypothetical, defense counsel drew in red what evidently another witness said, testified. That is correct. All right. Do you know anything about? And once again, you weren't here for the testimony, right? That's correct. So you don't know if this witness, this witness here, stated they did not see a house when the shooting happened? I have no knowledge. And you also do not know that the house they referred to was on a walk earlier. You don't know that, do you? No, I do not. And so you don't know if the wit this person here identifies a house Someplace else. That is correct. You also don't know, as they returned, they didn't see a house. Objection leading. That objection's overruled. Can we frame it? You say it again? I mean, what's the difference? He, what's the difference? I mean, he, he doesn't know anything about what the witness said about anything, so. That's correct. I do not. He, I don't he can know. lead him through that all day long, although we're not going to hear it all day long. No. You have no idea what this witness talked about when heading southbound, when the shooting happened, they, quote, did not see a house. That's correct. You don't know that, right? I do not know that. So this could be completely false, and you don't know whether or not that's true or not, right? That's true. I'm going to show you what's been marked as government exhibit 34, and just to make sure, I want to make sure I do this right, I'm going to show you images for the officer only. I'm going to sh Let me just show you. Officer, I'm showing you has been marked as Government Exhibit 34, images 4377 and 4378. They're labeled up on top right-hand corner. Correct. Do you recognize those images? Yes. What are those images of? Uh, again, it's the uh, photographs of um, the person taking the picture on Mr. Kelly's back porch, uh, looking back out towards where the decedent uh, 
uh, was located. Just out of caution, I'm going to move to admit Government Exhibit 34, I, images number 4377 and 4378. No objection. 4377 and 4378 from Exhibit 34 are admitted. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Granted. See that image? Yes, I do. Can you draw a circle around Detective Barba? That's a circle? Well, that's what, that's what it did. <laughs> Want me to do it again? Well, that's a square, but it's better. <laughs> and that's a view from what angle again? Uh, from Mr. Kelly's back porch, looking out to where the decedent is. And you can see... Detective Barba? Correct. In black shirt and tan pants. He's, he's in the distance, though, right? That is correct. I'm going to show you a slightly zoomed in. Try to take the glare off of that. You recognize that photo? I do. Can you circle Detective, Detective Barba for us? Same angle? Same angle, zoomed in. You can see a person, right? Yes. And on the, the footage, the, the BP footage, recall the cross-examination question on that? Yes. Um, and when you saw the defendant, George Kelly, in the footage, do you know if that was at the time of the shooting, or was it sometime after the shooting? I don't know when, when the shooting actually occurred. I know the time that he was located. Um, that's what I know. You saw, did you see Border Patrol with Mr. Kelly on that footage? No. Do you know if it was, but you have no, let me back up, strike that. Did you see any footage of where the victim's body was located? No. And you know the terrain? Correct. And you know this camera, right? You got this camera? There's several cameras out there, but yes. And do you know, if you know, are they triggered by motion? I don't know if it's, I, I do know there's some cameras out there that are triggered by motion, so it's an automatic, the camera would turn to motion. I don't know if these cameras were being live or someone was actually manipulating the cameras. So we have a couple things here. We, we have to have the, the lucky break of a camera being on the Kelly property, and then we have to have someone seeing motion, right? That's correct. The, you know there's a dead body in this case, right? Yes. And this is the most obvious question of all. Does a dead body move? No. So there's, if a camera, if, if the dead body's on the ground with vegetation, your testimony is a foot high, can you see that from one of those cameras that you reviewed? No. And when you look at that, those cameras... All right, hold on a second. I go... I, I haven't stepped in. I've allowed this testimony about the cameras. Unless I'm missing something, we've had no foundation as to date and time when these images were taken. Could have happened at any time. Uh, or any foundation as to the cameras, where they're located, what their capabilities are. But primarily, we don't even have any foundation as to date and time. All right, I'll, I'll back up. So unless someone's going to lay this foundation at some point, I'm going to strike the whole thing. I'll back up, Your Honor. I'll back up. You reviewed how many discs in this case from Border Patrol? A total of five. Total of five. And did, they, did you review those discs before trial? Yes. Did they have a date on the, the image? Yes. It's uh, January 30th. January 30th of what year? Of 23. And did they give you, was there, did you recognize items in, on the photo, like a pump house, a house, barn? That is correct, and they're all time stamped. That it's a running time. Do you remember what the running time was? Um, if I can refer to my report, I can give you those times when I documented. Sure. Let me get make sure I get the right report number. Do you have a stack over there? For mine, it should be. Uh, 
sequence 17. Yes. What's the, does it refresh your recollection of when the footage happened, when the footage you reviewed? It does. What's the time? I'm going to object um, as to foundation. I don't think this witness knows whether that time is accurate. Sustained. It's the footage from the disc, Your Honor, about what he reviewed. You want me to explain this to you in open court? I will. No, I don't, Your Honor. But <laughs> well, wait, then what's your comment about it? He doesn't. He didn't operate the camera. He's not qualified to say that the camera is somehow uh, set, tuned, or acclimated to a particular date and time, or that it's accurate. Is that correct? That's correct. How, he, how can you testify about the date and time of a camera if he's not the operator, he's not involved in it, it's taken by a different agency? Well, it, goes to the, it goes to the weight that he's reviewing the, the, the images on a specific date and a specific time, and he's recognized the images on the disc. He's recognized the image. So we've got date, time, and location. But he can't, there's no foundation that this witness can testify that that information is accurate. This is, this is taken from a Border Patrol camera by a Border Patrol agency by a Border Patrol. Is that right? I'll withdraw that, Your Honor, then. Right. I'll withdraw. Objection then. sustained. Almost done, Detective or Sergeant. Finally, on cross-examination, you were asked about taking measurements of the show casings? Correct. I'm going to show you image already admitted 4438. Do you recognize that image? I do. And you see the placards? Yes. Placards represent where show casing is located? That is correct. Can you tell approximately the distance between each placard? Uh, some foot and a half, some a little more, three, uh, three and a half feet. Um, from one to five, you're talking maybe uh, five feet. Let me show you government exhibit 4439. Different view. Correct. Right? Correct. You didn't move the placards around, did you? I did not. You didn't move the shell casings around, did you? I did not. All the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Any questions for this witness from any members of the jury? I see a couple. All right. All right, some questions from the jurors and the lawyers may ask some follow-ups to this as well. Um, question number one from the first juror. You stated in your testimony that you recognized the shell casing as an AK-47 round, but a 7.62 round can be used for different weapons. Um, if you know, is, is there any way or do you believe that there's a way, or do you know if it came from these shell casings actually came from uh, an AK-47. That round is designed for an AK-47. Um, it's, it's pretty much like a 30 caliber round. Um, I don't have any knowledge of that specific round utilized in another gun. I don't know that. Um, but that's, uh, that, that round was designed uh, for, for an AK-47 round. All right, thank you. Um, you stated in your, another question, you stated in your testimony that the spent rounds looked new. If the round was a week old, would you be able to tell the difference? 
there's a lot of variables in that. Um, we're in a drier uh, climate out here, especially in January. Um, a week, uh, probably not. Um, you know, again, if it had been raining for the past days leading up to it, I don't remember the forecast. I don't believe so. Uh, there was no um, dense. It wasn't buried. It was actually sitting on top of the rocks, uh, indicating that it was had recently been there. It didn't settle down into the dirt, if that makes sense. Um, and there was, you know, again, there was there was no uh, weathering on the shell casing on, on the eight shell casings that I uh, observed. They all appeared to be the same. Another question: What was the height of the tree branch break from ground level? Uh, roughly a foot and a half. Um, we did take measurements. I'd have to refer actually to uh, my supplement for that, but it's it's roughly about a foot and a half off the ground. Uh, there's photographs out there. Uh, we used a marker to uh, indicate it, and we and we did uh, measure that when we took it and uh, cut it in August. Another question from another juror, Sergeant Bunting: Is metal detection certification required in order to use them uh, for the sheriff's office? Uh, not for our office, no. Uh, All right, and a uh, sub question: If no, do metal detectors? have settings for precious metals or just for any metal? Uh, yes, there's different settings for different uh, metals. If you're specifically looking for something like gold, silver, um, the ones that we used was uh, we set it for all, all metals so that way we could uh, detect anything uh, going through. Um, a lot of the stuff that we located were actually uh, pieces of metal that were just laying out there, um, markings that were buried in the ground. Uh, that was it. All right, some question from another juror. A photo was shown of eight shell casings that were found and that were circled in yellow on the exhibit. Uh, one spent casings was circled in blue a few feet apart. Um, I think the, the juror is asking about concerning your testimony about the... Uh, ejection pattern of the shell casings. And the question is, were all the shell casings generated by the same rifle, um, looking at those ejection patterns, if, if, you're, if you're able to say? All the spent shell casings were, were all uh, the same uh, 7.62 by 3.9. They were all uh, the same color, the same style, everything looked at it. Um, my opinion, I don't know if I can say my opinion, um, the first shell casing that was located, the one that was circled in blue, um, to me, that would have to do a serious bounce. It, it could possibly, because th th that is rocks. You never know what's going to happen when it actually hits off the ground. Uh, to me, uh, that was two different placements of shots. Uh, just because of the plants that were in front, um, to me, it, looked, it appeared, in my opinion, is there was a shot and then moved, and then there were eight shots. Question from another juror. Um, did officers find a one HK type rifle during the execution of the first search warrant of the residence? I don't think you were there for that one. But, no. And then you were there, as there was a second search of the residence that you did participate in, I believe. Correct. And, an, and an, an HK type rifle was found in a bedroom um, during the execution of that second search warrant. Um, and I think the question is, um, was there one or, or two rifles, if you know? And I think there was some confusion about that because we heard some testimony about that from other witnesses earlier in the case. Right. But I, I do have knowledge in both those rifles, as I can, I can say. Any objection? No. All right, go ahead. No. Um, when the first rifle was collected, it was collected in a box, or I saw it in a box. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it was collected in a box. When I saw it the next day when I came in, uh, we had a couple officers actually come in. I overheard uh, both those officers. Actually, it was uh, uh, Deputy Cabrera mentioned something to one of the other detectives that uh, the rifle that we had uh, in, in our possession uh, did not match the one that she saw uh, the previous day. Uh, so, that, so that would have been the one from the first search warrant? That is correct. Okay. That Sorry. is correct. Um, she described uh, the rifle that she observed. Um, the one in the box that, that I observed uh, appeared to be new. It, it didn't appear to be fired. It was still in the box when I saw it. it uh, I'm not sure if it was fired, but it appeared new. Uh, the second rifle, as, as you saw, uh, was older. It was weathered. Again, uh, she indicated that the, the, 
the, they were bluing on the, the barrel, which means it's been heated up, it's been aged. The, the, the wood stock of that rifle appeared to be older and darker. And she also described a uh, flashlight with a orange button uh, taped to the barrel. Um, and that was the, the rifle that, that I was present on the second day and located. All right, thank you. Those, those are the questions. Rifles. Those two rifles, two AK-47 rifles. Sorry. All right, Father, those are the questions asked by the jurors. Uh, any other questions from any of the jurors before I turn it over to the counsel for follow-up? All right, seeing none, I'll hand the questions to the clerk. And uh, Mr. Jetty, you can ask follow-up questions to the questions from the jurors. No questions, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Larkin. Just real quick, do you have any idea why that rifle was not recovered on the first search? Again, I wasn't there, so I do not know. I don't have any other questions. Very well. Any other questions for this witness? Very well, sir. You may, sit, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And the state can call its next witness. Oh, yeah. uh, Detective uh, Ainsley, you want to retrieve this? Thank you. Appreciate it. My excuse, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. If you'd step over here to the witness stand, have a seat, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you briefly introduce yourself to the jury for us? Certainly. Um, my name is Aaron Brudenell. I can spell that. It's B-R-U-D-E-N-E-L-L. -L. And where do you work? Um, I'm employed as a forensic scientist at the Arizona Department of Public Safety's Crime Laboratory in Tucson. Mr. Brudenell, may I call you Aaron? Please. How long have you been with Department of Public Safety slash DPS? Um, I've been at the DPS lab and in my current function since 2007. And what's your, walk us through bird's eye view of your career with DPS. Certainly, um, <coughs> excuse me one moment. <coughs> um, I started in 2007 as a forensic scientist um, in the firearm and tool mark unit. Um, and I've been with that unit and that laboratory for the duration of my time there. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the Tucson City Police Department in a similar capacity at their crime laboratory. And I've had earlier uh, career uh, activity in firearms at the Idaho State Police. So Idaho, Tucson, and DPS. Correct. And I had a very brief stint at the Washington State Patrol, but I was assigned to a different unit than firearms. And what does a forensic scientist do in the, in the area of firearms? So the firearm and tool mark section is largely focused on the examination of firearms, fired ammunition, uh, such as cartridge cases or bullets. Uh, occasionally we'll get involved in other aspects of a shooting incident, um, such as a reconstruction, uh, looking at gunshot residues, things of that nature. And the tool mark aspect of it comes from the way that we're able to use tool marks from the manufacturing process of firearms to identify the fired components, such as bullets or cartridge cases, to a specific gun. And we can do that with other common types of tools and marks under the right set of circumstances as well. And just, I'm just going to jump forward, but in this case, were you ever provided a projectile in this case? No. In this case, the, uh, the components I received were all fired cartridge cases or unfired ammunition. And that, that just so you know, the, the projectile itself, when you're talking about the tool component of the forensic science the tool component, you, you can able, you're able to, like a fingerprint, that the bullet can be matched to a gun based upon what happens to the bullet? Uh, it's, it's similar to a fingerprint in that it's a pattern uh, recognition system. 
Um, it's uh, microscopic patterns are what we focus on, and unlike fingerprints, the patterns we look at are generated through the manufacturing process of having metal tools, cutting the metal parts that are made into firearm components. But it essentially works the same way. We're able to look at patterns, compare them to each other, and then compare them to the source to see if they're fired from the same origin. But no bullet in this case, right? That's correct. In this case, I didn't have a single bullet to examine, uh, but there were fired cartridge cases submitted, and the technique is similar, uh, just looking at different types of marks from different parts of the gun. So let's go back to your experience and training. Um, so we have Washington, Idaho, Tucson, and DPS. Correct. All right. Walk me through it. How many cases have collectively have you worked on as a forensic scientist in the, in the, in, with, with firearms? Certainly. In the, in the firearm um, and tool mark area, I would say approximately 1,000 cases in my career. I got my training in 2000 and 2001 with the ATF's National Firearm Examiner Academy. It's a year-long course dedicated to firearm forensics, and I was fortunate to be in the second class that they've offered. Um, and that, that program covers, for about a year, um, a lot of different aspects of the firearm and toolmark forensics. It's not considered sufficient on its own. You still have to continue to do training within the agency where you're working and get through all the procedures, because it's about a two-year process to train a firearm examiner. So over a thousand cases you worked on? I would say approximately one thousand, give or take. And and when you when you work on a case, are you given any information about the case itself? Um, it varies. Uh, in some cases, all I have is a request for, say, to do a function check on a firearm to see if it's operable, uh, or something else like that. In other cases where there are more involved requests or more information that is given to me because of the circumstances of my analysis, I'll have a lot more background information. Does that background assist you in your evaluation? It can, yes, in some cases. In your experience with type of weapons, walk me through the, the type of weapons you have, with cases you worked on and the training you've done with the type of weapons. Sure. Uh, most firearms are broken down into a couple of categories. You have handguns and long guns. So long guns would be rifles or shotguns. And uh, handguns, there's usually semi-automatic pistols and revolvers, but there's some other odds and ends like derringers and single-shot pistols, things like that. Um, those are the majority of the types of cases I see. Um, and in some cases, I'll have something as simple as just a single-fired bullet, and there might be a request to know what gun this could have come from. And in other cases, I'll have a large variety of evidence from a certain incident and be asked a number of questions based on the evidence and what's needed. And I just want to make sure I, I heard that correctly. Um, semi-automatic weapons also in your forte? Yes, semi-automatic uh, firearms, handguns, rifles, and other types as well. How about an AK-47? Sure. The AK-47 is a, it's, it's kind of like Kleenex. Uh, it's a term that we use you know, based on the original term, but there's what I would call AK-type rifles and firearms in circulation from a variety of sources. And when you have a when you when you conduct a forensic examination or test, walk us through the the first step you do through the last step you do for that forensic examination. So typically, with a firearm, um, I'll examine the firearm for any obvious defects, any problems with it that appear to its functionality. Um, you know, manipulating the action, test firing, excuse me, testing safeties before firing them. Um, and looking at any other elements of that um, firearms operating condition, documenting the serial number, things like that. Um, once I'm satisfied the firearm is safe to fire and there aren't any problems with it, I'll go ahead and usually do an initial test firing to verify that the gun's operable. Uh, in some cases, when we have fired components, such as fired cartridge cases, I might wait and examine those cartridge cases preliminarily first to see if I can select ammunition based on those cartridge cases to make the comparison aspect more uh, successful. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's different types of ammunition, different materials, and so if you have, for example, a brass cartridge case in evidence, it would make sense to use that same type of ammunition if possible before you're test firing. The, once the test firing portion is done, those fired items, the test fires that I generated in the lab, will be compared to each other. 
And I do that because I want to make certain that there's enough evidence, or excuse me, uh, enough information on the characteristics I can see through the microscope to compare those to each other favorably. And essentially, it's a, what we would call in, in the forensic science or other sciences a positive control. I have knowns generated from the same firearm that I can look at each other, look and compare them to each other, and see if they have enough agreement between those marks that I'm looking for before comparing them to unknowns. Uh, once I've satisfied myself that there's enough information on the test-to-test -test comparisons, then I'll compare those test fires to the evidence in question, the items that are unknown, and see if I can render an opinion based on that same type of comparison. And that opinion is geared towards identifying the same weapon or a weapon? What's the opinion based upon when you compare knowns to unknowns? Um, comparing the knowns to the unknowns is to see if I can find the same type of agreement. Um, let me give a hypothetical. Let's assume the the test fires don't have any really relevant information or uh, characteristics or anything I can see on the microscope that will give me the ability to make that determination, then there's really no hope in comparing them to the evidence for identification purposes. Might be a way to rule them out if there's obvious marks that are present, say, on the evidence. Um, more typically, and in this case, um, there was enough uh, characteristic evidence, characteristic features on those surfaces of the fired test fires that compare to each other to then favorably compare them to the evidence in question. So that's walking through a, the forensic examination of a firearm. In your experience, have you looked at, evaluated injuries from a firearm? Occasionally, yes. I've seen injuries from projectiles, usually from the bullets. Any projectiles, injuries from a semi-automatic weapon? Yes, certainly. Including the AK? That's correct. And when I say that, you obviously have reviewed cases where there's an entry wound? Uh, yes, um, an entry wound um, to an individual um, there, uh, is usually determined by the medical examiner in a case of fatality. Um, and in that case, the medical examiner's uh, opinion or report is something I might review. Um, and that would give me information on where the, the first entry of that projectile was. Um, and then, of course, the question then comes if the bullet is still in, say, a body, then that would be a penetrating gunshot wound. But if it passes completely through the body, the term is a perforating wound. And in a case like that, there's an exit wound that can be also evaluated. Did you evaluate any injury wounds in this case? In this case, I looked at the medical examiner's report and saw photographs of both wounds, yes. Can you give an opinion about the type of wound? Um, looking at the, both the entry and the exit wounds, um, the projectile did not appear to be hitting in what I would call a stable configuration. And what I mean by that is a normal bullet is fired and it has a spin that stabilizes that bullet. So it points nose toward the target the whole way from the gun to where it impacts. Now, if uh, that occurs, usually you have an entry wound that is either round or oval to a symmetrical degree. On the other hand, if a projectile loses its stability for some reason, that bullet may not be uh, pointing nose first when it impacts, and it have, will have a different hole pr produced based on the part of the bullet that strikes and the profile as it hits. Uh, for example, um, if you have a rifle bullet that is roughly boat shaped, if you looked at it from the side, it had the outline of say a boat with a pointy tip and kind of a flat back, um, that bullet could go through sideways or at an angle producing an irregular hole in the item struck or the person or the individual. And you saw the you saw the entry wound and exit wound in this case. Yes, I have. Yes. Are those consistent with an AK type weapon? Yes, the uh, profile I saw did. I would say were consistent with the types of shapes that you see from a rifle bullet of that type. And how powerful is an AK type weapon? Um, the cartridge is known as the. Um, I'm going to describe it in the metric term that it's usually given. It's a 7.62 millimeter by 39 cartridge. Um, what that amounts to is it's a 30 caliber bullet, but it's in a cartridge case that's shorter than a typical hunting rifle. Um, 
it is what we would call an intermediate cartridge, which is to say that a high-powered rifle, a rifle that would be used for killing large game or shooting at long distances, it usually has a much larger cartridge case. It might be the same caliber, but it won't have as much, it'll have more powder than what's in the intermediate cartridges. Likewise, uh, handgun cartridges typically have a lot less power, and the cartridge cases are smaller, and they have less force. So comparing the two, the intermediate rifle cartridge is more powerful than, say, a handgun cartridge or something that would be fired in a submachine gun. But it is less powerful than a rifle cartridge that might be used by a hunter or were used in the military, say, in the first half of the 20th century. And then do you know anything about uh, bullets themselves? Yes, uh, specifically. Yeah, like what, explain to the jury what a, a full metal jacket bullet is. Oh, yes. Uh, a fully jacketed bullet or full metal jacket bullet has whatever the core is made out of. Usually it's lead. And surrounding that is an entire a jacket, what we call it, basically a coating of a harder metal, um, such as copper, um, in some cases steel. Um, and typically the the analogy for this is you have a heavy but soft lead center and a more rigid um, exterior. I like to think of a hard-boiled egg, for example. The jacket is the kind of the outer shell, and the core is the larger mass that's inside. It's softer and is more likely to deform than the jacket. Um, jacketed bullets basically have been used for over 100 years because if you take a soft metal like lead and shoot it down the barrel fast enough, the energy of the friction and from the power can eventually cause that lead to start to liquefy, start to vaporize more in the barrel of the gun. So to have uh, higher velocities, you need to have a jacket surrounding the lead. That's typically and historically how the, the jacketed bullets have been formed. A fully jacketed bullet is one that usually ends at a point or a tip and doesn't have any kind of hollow point or other feature to it to cause it to expand on impact. So let me ask you, um, you were asked to do an evaluation in this case, correct? Yes, I was. Do you remember the case number, case name? Um, not off the top of my head. I could probably refresh my notes, my recollection with my notes. Do you remember, may I approach? Yes. Thank you. There's several reports there. I just want you to refresh your recollection about the case you worked on. Yes, um, each uh, case that's assigned in our system is given a unique laboratory number, for example, or case number. Um, this one was 2023-702-235. And you remember the, is there a subject, a defendant? Yes, defendant, well, the name associated with our report is George Kelly. And. You reviewed some items that were sent to you, right? Yes, several items. And this, we're going to talk about the gun. You reviewed an AK-47? Yes, yeah, uh, technically a, a Wasser 10, W-A-S-R 10. That's the exact model number by the manufacturer, but it's basically a semi-automatic AK-type rifle. I'm going to get you some glo you have gloves up there. Yes. You have permission for the witness to put gloves on and take a look at Government Exhibit 101. Aaron, go ahead and put gloves on. Come on down to the table in the center of the, of the center of the well. Can do. That big long box is Government Exhibit One Zero One. So you want to open that lid for me? It's already been admitted. You recognize that weapon? So, Aaron, you, re you mind if I talk from behind your back, do you? Not at all. Okay. You recognize that weapon as the weapon that you analyzed in this case? I do. I recognize my initials on the tag through the trigger guard. All right. And just can you just take it out for me, Aaron? Sure.
And walk us through um, how you do the functionality and safety evaluation. Not the functionality, that's a different question, but the safety and operability. Walk us through what you do when you look at a gun like that. Um, this type of firearm, this particular rifle, has one manual safety on the outside. It's a large lever that I'm touching right here. It essentially blocks the sear mechanism on the inside. There's a separate safety that is part of the internal mechanism that has to do with how the action cycles and locks up. Um, I'm able to evaluate those in the laboratory by manipulating the action, testing the trigger with the safety in multiple positions, and observing the internal parts through the opening here that I can see, or by removing the dust cover and examining them um, without it, so I can see the internal operations function. And in your evaluation of that weapon, did that gun appear to be functionally correct, functionally oper uh, function? You know the word I'm trying to find. Is it is it functioning appropriately? Yes, the the firearm was functioning normally. The safety features were working. Um, the only thing I noted was that the the dust cover appeared to be a little bit loose, but there was nothing about that that it impacted the way the firearm works. Is there a, I'm going to mess this up, is there a P scope or a P, something to do about the viewing of aiming the weapon? Does that sound familiar? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to in the scope. Not a scope, but how you aim the weapon, is there, can you adjust? Oh, I think I know what you're referring to. Yeah, there's a sighting system. Um, these rifles have a sighting system here, often called a ladder sight. It has a series of positions that if you are shooting at a farther target and you want the firearm to still hit the target, you will use a different setting on the sight so that the angle of elevation of your barrel is higher when the sights are aligned on the target. Um, this sight has a couple of positions. Its numbers go from 1 to 10, but P is sort of the rear position. I don't know exactly what P stands for, but in these types of firearms, that's often referred to as what's called a battle sight. And it's essentially a approximately 300 yard position. And you can put that weapon back down, Aaron, okay. in the box. And there's a few other items in the box, Aaron. There's a, it's already been admitted part of the, is there a flashlight and duct tape? Yes, there's a flashlight. Um, there's some, uh, looks like wide duct tape. Uh, this appears to have come off of the front portion of the firearm at some point you know, prior to packaging. There's tape residue on that same portion forward of the handguard. Um, there's also uh, the envelope that contains the test fires that I generated during my shooting of the firearm. That's going to be my next question. Can you go ahead and take that envelope and return to your seat? I think there's some scissors up there for you too. If you return to your seat up there. There's some scissors up there? I found them, yes. Before you open that, do you recognize what that is? Yes, these are the test fires that I generated. I put them in an envelope with the markings from the firearm, and my initials appear on the package as well. So just so we understand this, test fires you used with this weapon at the DPS lab. That's correct. And to clarify, typically we retain test fires from ammunition that we provide to shoot the firearms. In this case, because there was a need to use the ammunition that was collected with the firearm, uh, the fired cartridge cases, because they were originally evidence, are returned as evidence as well. So those, so just for you, where, where did those rounds come from? Um, uh, these came from other ammunition that was recovered with this firearm and submitted to the laboratory. Okay, go ahead and open. And just for the record, I think 101 collectively was admitted, but we can make a specific record. 101.1, referring to the shell casings, moved to admission the shell casing spent used by Aaron in his forensic review. No objection. All right, so what will be marked is 101.1 .1 is admitted. Go ahead and open it and permission to publish, Your Honor? Grant. You want to take one of those out and show the jury for us? Certainly. Uh, there are 10 inside. Um, I'll pull one out. I'm holding it here. Um, it's a typical uh, 7.62 by 39 millimeter cartridge case. 
It's gray in color, but it is made of steel, and the gray is just a polymer coating to keep the steel from rusting. Um, it's this particular one's listed as number two, so of the series I shot, this would, would have been in the second one. All right, Aaron, I'm gonna put that back in the envelope so we just keep things separate. I'm gonna show you Government Exhibit 103. I want you to keep those separate from each other, okay? Aaron? Certainly. We'll wait for a sec. On Government Exhibit 103 to 106, is that what the envelope says? Sorry, I'm looking for your exhibit number. Yes, okay. State Exhibit 103 through 106. Go ahead and take out, there's individual envelopes. You can take out, doesn't matter which one. Close your eyes and pick one out of there. And tell me which one you picked out. I removed all four. I'm just going to put three of them back for the time being. Um, the one I have here is um, Exhibit 105. 105. Go ahead and put, take 105 out and put it on top of the, the witness stand where you're at. You just put the envelope next to it just so we don't get these confused. And then can you take one of your spec... The one that one of the ones that you used and put it side by side. Yes, I can. Is that close enough? Sure. Are they the same? Yeah, essentially, they are um, the same manufacturer um, and have the same uh, head stamp markings, uh, which is how the manufacturer of the ammunition marks the individual cartridges. Hey, Karen. Now let's correctly put them back in the appropriate envelopes. And and for what it's worth, uh, when we examine these in the laboratory, we do mark the inside of the cartridge case as well with a scribe that we can see under a microscope. So if the table gets knocked over, we can sort out what was taken from which envelope. And what can you put? The, the, the 103, 106, can you put those together so I can take those away from you so we don't yes. cross? No. Thank you. <coughs> Just so I have out the record, you still have 101.1 .1 up there. I do, and it has not been marked such, so. Yeah, it's not been marked yet. All right, also... Um, you, te you looked at the safety of the weapon, the functionality of the weapon, and now we're talking about the operation, <laughs> the oper operability of the weapon, right? Yes. Um, and once you've cycled the firearm sufficiently in the laboratory to see how it's uh, functioning without ammunition, the next step is to, to actually load ammunition and test fire it. Um, because the firearm was working in all respects, and just to clarify the sequence, I, I also knew that I was going to be asked to do a certain type of testing for the ejection pattern to evaluate where those cartridge cases go when they come out of the gun, I decided to combine the efforts. That's why I have 10 test fires, and they were test fired at a range where I can record their locations after they came out of the gun where they landed. And then I use those test fires for my comparison purposes as well. And when you when you received the, the test ammo, did you receive that in a... You should receive just 10, or did you receive a package? Um, I believe I received a, a, a package that had several magazines loaded with ammunition. And you tested, you just fired, your, you fired the weapon, right? Uh, yes, and because... Part of my goal was to um, take note of where the cartridge cases landed after they were fired. Um, I had some assistance. I stood at a flat range, fired from my shoulder height, which is approximately five feet, um, to a distance, um, you know, level distance at a range. And for each shot fired, the cartridge case was subsequently marked, um, and its location where it first impacted and then where it bounced was documented as well. All right, we're going to go over that in a sec, but sure. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 135, Permission to Approach Honor. 
read it. Can you go ahead and cut that open for me? Sure. And do you recognize any writing on top of that box? I believe so. I think I see my, well, I'm not sure if I see my initials. There they are. Yep. Can you go ahead and open it? I'm not, I'm not looking to publish, but go ahead and open it and see what's inside. You recognize what's inside? I do. What's inside? Um, several magazines uh, for this particular rifle or that would fit this particular rifle. Um, I could see that on them there are my initials and numbers for those magazines as I designated them when I inventoried them in the laboratory. Is that the, the same type of magazine that you use to test fire this weapon? Yes, I used one of these for that purpose as well. You're going to move to admit Exhibit 135, which is item 5JA into record. Into evidence, I mean. Could we go on the headset real quick, Judge? In the box there, you got one of those magazines, right? Um, sorry, would you repeat that? One of those magazines in the box was used to test fire the weapon? That's correct. There was the, I used the smallest one. It okay. um, contained 10 rounds, and I removed them and then used it for my test firing purposes. Do you, do you have it? Is it visible inside that box? I could certainly get it out. I might have to open the inner package, and the ammunition had been returned to it. So if you wanted me to use it, I may need to unload it first. Yeah, can you can you um, unwrap that bag inside there and take out the one that you actually used? I can do that. Okay. And based upon conversation with the defense counsel in, in the court, I'm going to move to admit that one magazine, Your Honor, that he used, the small one. And we'll call it 135.1. And we'll rebox it in a different box. All right. So after he, assuming he identifies it, after he identifies it, you can move for its admission. Um, actually, I'm fortunate. This particular magazine does not have any ammunition in it right now. It's completely empty, and it's the one that I used. Okay. Well, so go ahead. And you have it out. I do. I have. You it recognize it? I do. Move to admit Government Exhibit One Thirty Five One Thirty Five Point One. All right. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Well, 135.1, uh, it's anticipated it'll be marked with that number. 135.1 is admitted. Yeah, put, put the rest in there. And just so we, you can put the flaps down stuff, and you can move that out of your way. So do you have the small magazine still out? I do. It's right here. Oh, you want to publish it for the jury? I could do that. <coughs> this is a 10-round magazine um, for that particular type of rifle. And I also recognize my initials and the number seven. Um, there were a total of seven magazines in the package. One was from a pistol. The other six were f varying sizes and types for uh, the rifle. And this is one of them. And this is the one that I used. And the, the, the spent shell casings that you used from that magazine do they match the same manufacturer and type from the ones, the shell casings that were recovered on site? Uh, that is correct. Let's talk about the, the gun operability. So when you tested that, that weapon, walk us through, like, is it a firing range inside the, the DPS facility? Walk us through. Oh, we do have a facility like that, but as I mentioned earlier, because I wanted to capture the ejection pattern, I had to do it at an outdoor facility where there was much more room, and we have one available to us. Um, and so that range, I basically positioned myself at a fixed location that I could mark and then two measurements from. I fired the gun at my shoulder height level 
into the berm at approximately 100 some yards and then keeping the same point of impact and recording the location of the fired cartridge cases as they came out of the gun first where they initially hit and then where they came to rest after bouncing that was how i was able to collect all 10 of the cartridge cases and collect their information on where they landed and and, you, and so do you fire at targets not specifically target but i picked a spot on the berm that i could reliably aim at consistently right can i retrieve the reports i handed to you up there yes the reports and i'm just going to do some housekeeping real quick <clears throat> Place 135.1 in that bag. This magazine? Yeah. Is there a pin up there for you? Um, I do not see one. You list out 135.1 on the picture initials on it. We'll have Detective Ianza seal it up when we're done here. Okay. All I did is put 135.1, and I put my initials right after that. Okay. Oh, I was going to collect the report. Would you like me to seal this now or wait for later? I, uh, I do not. We can do it. Yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. Tape sealed the item and put my initials and uh, ID number on across the tape. Thank you. I'm going to show you with some of the photographs from your report. I'm just going to show you the, the photographs. I'm going to show defense counsel what's been marked as government exhibit 12.1. Well, it, um, I'm guessing that you're about to uh, go into kind of the details, the details of his findings. So maybe it's better we start that after lunch. Is that sure. all right? Sure. Okay. So we're going to break for lunch. Uh, I'm going to stay here and talk to the lawyers about some issues in the case. We'll have you back after lunch. I'll excuse you for lunch. Uh, we'll take a break from now until 1.30. We'll recommence with the testimony at 1.30. And I'll excuse the jury and I'll stay in the courtroom. We rise before... You can have a seat. The record will show the absence of the jurors' counsel and the defendant are present. All right, just uh, before we break for lunch, just want to talk a little bit about this, the um, planned proposed visit to the alleged crime scene. Um, we're about 48 hours away from when that will happen, if it's going to happen. Um, is there some kind of uh, – well, you mentioned that there are 12 locations that the parties have agreed to at the residence – 
where you've agreed the jurors will go and look at uh, those various locations in addition to uh, traveling to the border. Is there some kind of, you know, like a key that you would have a map that's associated with a map that would just, I could see so that I know what the 12, just what the 12 things are and how you've labeled them? Sure. We haven't created that yet, but we were just going to do number one label, number two label, right. and that was it. All right. If you just do, you know, anything like that in any format, I don't care, just so I know what the 12 things are. Um, and is that all? There were some, you were still had some areas of disagreement. I didn't think they were very major, but has that all been resolved as to them? I don't think yourself. we had a disagreement. I don't think there's any disagreement right. about the 12 placards, John. Okay. And um, in terms of the visit to the border, uh, Deputy Martinez has gone out there and, and looked at uh, what would be involved in transporting the jurors to the border. It can be done, uh, as we've heard throughout the testimony, there's no road directly from the ranch to the border, but he says there are obviously a spider web of roads out there, and it took you about take about 15 or 16 minutes from the residence. From the house to the border. Yeah, so he, he tracked out a, a, a route that would um, involve us taking the jurors uh, on, a, on a drive about 15 or 16 minutes to the border using some of these roads. Is there any problem with that? No objection, Your Honor. No. All right. Finally, um, you know, we... <clears throat> I try to anticipate things, and um, we heard and we saw some photographs that were taken and Detective Bunting testified to about um, Detective, with Detective Barba in the distance. Um, it would not surprise me if when we're out there, the jurors would tell us, although I don't really anticipate having any dialogue with them, but it would not surprise me if the jurors would tell us that they want to try to recreate something like that. And I'm sure that wasn't part of the 12, that wasn't one of the 12 locations of having someone stand there, right? Anyway, think about that uh, because, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that came up. And uh, I'd like to have some discussion about it before we go out there so that we have a plan to deal with that um, eventuality if it happens, fair enough. And if there's anything else you can think of that might come up, let's try to anticipate it and deal with it ahead of time. Okay? All right. In the meantime, uh, we are internally here uh, working on some of the logistics of this, but I'm hoping that all that works out. But if it works out, the plan would be Thursday afternoon, um, after lunch, we gather the jurors up. There's a special van, and they'll be transported separately there, and, and uh, we do it at that time. All right? Just to clarify, we're going to have court morning court on Thursday. Correct. Okay. okay. Well, talk to your lawyers. Your, Judge, your I client, volunteer. Your client's raising his hand, so I don't oh. want him to say something unless he talks to you first. I just wanted to volunteer the skeleton if we put camo on him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, as long as you all agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's all we have here. Okay. All right, great. Uh, we're in recess until 1.30. Thank you. Judge, he just wanted to apologize for the phone going off. He wasn't expecting that. Thank you.